Good morning. Uh, before I read the passage, I was standing there as we've been singing this morning. I was thinking about uh, the blessings of being an American. Uh, and not to be political, but uh, I think it was Walt Whitman, who was a great uh, poet and political satirist, who said, America is the best idea the world's ever had. And that really is true, and yet it pales in comparison. As good a gift as it has been to the world, pales in comparison to the gift of Jesus Christ that's been given to us. So over the next two or three days, as we're grilling, as we're swimming, as we're doing whatever we do on July 4th, many of us will be working probably, but let's just think about that, not, not just the fact that this is a great place to live, but the gift of Jesus Christ to each and every one of you that accept it is the greatest gift the world has ever known. And so our passage today is from the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 6th verse. And the Bible says, And without faith it is impossible to please him, for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we are grateful for your son Jesus. And Lord, while we do have faith, sometimes that is tested. And Lord, we just pray that today, as we look into your word, Lord, that we'd be not only grateful and thankful for this place we call America, but that we'd be thankful for the opportunity that we have to share your good news with the world. Father, we are grateful for our nation, for men and women who for many generations now put themselves in harm's way so that we might have the freedom we enjoy, so that we might have the opportunity to assemble just as we do at this very moment. Let us never take that gift for granted, but more importantly, let us never take for granted the gift of your son, Jesus. And it is in his name we ask this prayer. Amen. Go ahead and turn to Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes 3, we're going to look at verses 16 through chapter 4. As you're turning there, Solomon has really stretched our thinking these last few chapters. In some regards, he had made us pause and consider our life, what we're seeking to accomplish, what we're working towards. Solomon has told us that he has tried everything to find meaning in this world and that everything has left, everything he has seen has left him wanting more. He has been unfulfilled and in turn said that this world is meaningless. He has tried power. He tried money. He tried architecture. He tried women. He tried everything and said it was all meaningless and left him unsatisfied. And without lasting fulfillment. And it's kind of hard because he says, it's kind of hard truths to hear because he said that generation comes and generation goes. Generation after generation and try the same thing. They seek fulfillment in this world and this world never gives it to them. But we never learn our lesson. We practice the same thing and do the same things that the generations have done before us. And he goes on to say that God keeps us busy. God gives us work. So the things that we do, the work that we have and seek to accomplish every day is not a bad thing. God gives us that to keep us busy. 
But even our work and the little things that God keeps us busy with, those things will never bring us lasting fulfillment and satisfaction. That there's only one that will bring lasting fulfillment and satisfaction, and his name is Jesus. And that we ought to fear God and keep his commandments as we looked at the end of chapter, or, or at the end of chapter 12. And so we're going to continue on the same theme because Solomon is continuing to teach us this. He's continuing to stretch our thinking. As you read through this, you may ask yourself these type of questions. Well, well if generation comes and generation goes and it's all meaningless, then, then why are we here? What is the reason that we exist? And that's answered in Genesis, right? That we exist to glorify God. That we are here to bring glory to God. We are here to magnify the name of Jesus. But we're only here on earth for a short little time and then we spend eternity in heaven. And so with this short little time that God's given us, while, while God has left us to be busy with often meaningless things, we can still lay up treasures in heaven. We can still do great things for the glory of God. We can still glorify God, love God, and love others and tell others how to be redeemed. And we need to remember that. Well, to actually understand that, I think we have to have the right view of this world. We have to have the right view of this world. Point one that I want you to get is this. The world is futile. It's futile. Futile means incapable of producing any useful result. Pointless. The world is incapable of producing any useful result. Christ Center Commentary says this, Solomon has made the point throughout Ecclesiastes that if this cursed world is all there is, then nothing you attempt to find meaning in will satisfy and work. And that is the point that Solomon is continuing to make, that this world is futile. Even you say, well, pastor, what about the justice in this world? What about the, the politics in this world? Can't we make real change? No. You can keep the boat ashore. You can keep the boat afloat for a short little time. But at the end of the day, every boat will be sucked into this vortex of brokenness called this world. And that's the reality. Every nation will be sucked into it. It does not matter if that generation, what it's built on or what it says it lives for. This is not heaven. And it never will be. And so this is what he's about to tell us. Look at verse 16. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. Hear that. In the place of justice. In our politics, in our pleasures, in everything. In this world where we see guilty and people are deemed innocent. Even in what we consider the most just of this world, they're still guilty people. We're still guilty. We say this all the time, well that's not fair. We see something happen and we say, well that's not fair. And then people respond with what? Life's not fair. We live in a world where the guilty are deemed innocent more than they should. Well, that's not fair. Well, well life's not fair. Because we live in a broken, depraved, and futile world. And we have to understand that. We have a world full of oppression and cruelty. And everybody, Christian and non-Christian, we all see it. If we'll really admit it, we all see it. We see this world for what it is. Now, while we want to imagine it's different, we want to imagine this world will be different to us or, or give us something that it hasn't given any of the generations before us, we all want to believe that. But it's never true. When we really think about this world, we all want this world to be different. We all want it to be something great. But it'll never be. Ever. John Mayer has a song, Waiting on the World to Change. Let me read it to you. 
Me and all my friends were all misunderstood. They say we stand for nothing, and there's no way we ever could. Now we see everything that's going wrong with the world and those who lead it. We just feel like we don't have the means to rise above and beat it. It ain't about means. You won't beat it. He goes on and says, says this. So we keep waiting, waiting on the world to change. We keep waiting, waiting on the world to change. It's hard to beat the system when we're standing at a distance. So we keep waiting, waiting on the world to change. Now, if we had the power to bring our neighbors home from war, they would have never missed a Christmas, no more ribbons on the door. And when you trust your television, when you get what you get is what you got, because when they own the information, oh, they can blend it all they want. That's why we're waiting, waiting on the world to change. And we see it, right? We see what the television's saying. We see the wars, and we see everything that is broken in this world, and we want something different. But this world will never bring us anything different than sin and depravity and brokenness. And I know what people say. Well, if we can get the right people in office, if I can... If I can do this, if I can get the right person, if I can stop this, then the world will be better. And I'm not telling you to not try to make the world better, but hear this. This world, like I said, is a vortex of brokenness. And you can be in that boat and paddle all you want and do good all you want. But at the end of the day, the world will suck that boat in and destroy it. Because that is the world that we live in. It is called brokenness and depravity. It's a fallen world, incapable, incapable of producing anything useful. John Lennon says this, you, you may say I'm a dreamer, but I'm not the only one. I hope someday you'll join us and the world will be as one. Imagine no possessions. I wonder if you can. No need for greed or hunger. A brotherhood of man. Imagine all the people sharing all the world. Imagine heaven, John. Like, yeah. Imagine being in this place where you're together with no more sin and no more heartache and where you can just be at peace with one another. Yeah, it sounds awesome. It's going to be great. Jesus is there. We'll glorify him. We'll all be at peace. There'll be no more suffering and no more hunger and no more war and no more heartache. It's going to be great. It'll never be here. Ever. But we all long for it. We long for the day when justice will reign and life will be fair and people who are, are, are traffickers will get what's coming to them. We all long for justice. All of us. And I'm not saying you shouldn't go in politics. Don't hear that. I'm not saying you shouldn't do your best to make this world a better place. We should. We should be busy working hard with what God has given us to work hard with. But don't dream that it's heaven because this place will never be. Ever. And that's what Solomon is saying. He's saying that there is not even, even justice is wicked in this world. That politics are wicked in this world. That even people who are trying to do good at the end of the day will face brokenness and despair. And so we need to hear this. The only way that we can grow is to really understand this. And people sell their whole lives. They give their whole lives to trying to make this world just a little better. And let me say again. I'm not saying you shouldn't. Christians should make this world better. No doubt. But we get caught up on, again, if we can get the right person in office, if we can, if we can eliminate shootings, if we can take this away, if we could do this. What we need to focus on 
is telling people that there is a better place. It's heaven. And the way to get there is through Jesus. And that people should see us as Christians living in this world and doing good for the glory of God. They should see us loving others and loving God supremely and and making our world and neighborhood and community better for the glory of God, not to make this heaven as it will never be. And so we continue to read. Listen to what he says. Moreover, I saw under the sun then the place of justice, even there was wickedness. Then the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. And I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happened to the children of man and what happens to the beast is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath and man has no advantage over the beast for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? He's saying, look at our life. We all will come to an end just like the good person and the beast or the righteous and the beast. It comes to an end and we take our last breath. And what happens after, you don't know. We only know what the word tells us through Jesus. And I'm going to bank on that. I'm going to bank on eternal life with Jesus because of Jesus. I'm going to live my life accordingly. So if you see, if they say that all of this is vanity, we say, well, pastor, what should we do? Well, I think Solomon tells us here. So I say there's nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work. That we should live our life. So point two, this is, this is what we should do as Christians. If we want to live a fruitful life, here's what we should do. Number one, seek God, lay up treasures in heaven, and enjoy life for God's glory. Seek God, lay up treasures in heaven, and enjoy life for God's glory. If I told you you had a month to live, what would you do? Would you seek God? I think so. Would you, would you lay up treasures in heaven, man, try to do the most you can to tell, make sure your neighbors and your friends, your family know Jesus? Yeah. Would you enjoy life? Yeah, you would. You'd, you'd capture every moment, this, this, this grilling out, whatever, of the fourth, swimming by the pool, you'd enjoy it, Right? You'd probably do some backflips, even if you got hurt, it don't really matter, right? You'd do some cannonballs into the water and play some soccer with the kids. Even if you pull something, it's okay. You got one month, right? You'd enjoy it. That's what Solomon's saying. And he said it over and over in these couple of chapters. Enjoy life. It is but a season. It is short. Why can't we enjoy life? Why can't we seek God and lay up treasures in heaven and enjoy life for God's glory? Why? You say, well, well, pastor, sin, sure. Anxiety, yeah. Not prioritizing life, yeah, sure. Busyness. Lack of eternal perspective. All of those reasons is why we're not enjoying life. We are clouded and distracted by the sins and the brokenness and, and, and the overwhelming burdens of this futile world. And it strips our joy from us. We're, we're so afraid of cutting loose and letting ourselves go and enjoying all that God's given us. We're, we're so afraid of that. 
And I can't figure out why, and it's because of this world. We can't really put our finger on why we don't just seek God, lay up treasures in heaven, and enjoy life. It's hard to put our finger on it until we realize that the world around us is crushing us, distracting us, breaking us, and keeping us busy. And we can't see it. We're concerned about deadlines and work and this and that. And it's hard. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6 talks about this laying up treasures in heaven and seeking the Lord and doing good. And I love this whole chapter. But Matthew 6 starts off with giving to the needy. Goes on to talk about the Lord's Prayer and then fasting. And then we get to verse 19. And listen to what Matthew 6 verse 19 tells us. Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where, where neither moth nor rust destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body. So if your light is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light is in, uh, in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Verse 25. Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing, Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet the heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more va- of more value than they? And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his, li- his span of life? And why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need of them. But seek first the kingdom of God, And his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow. For tomorrow will be anxious for itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Do you see how the same thing, same message that Solomon is telling us is intertwined here? He talks about the lily of the field. He talks about the lily of the field. How it will be beautiful and then burnt. How it will spot and be, oh, it's beautiful. and And then go away. And that's our life. Our life will pop up and then go away. And we spend this short little life we have being anxious or or not having faith or not laying up treasures in heaven. And and this is what Solomon is trying to teach us. He spent his entire, entire life trying to find fulfillment in this world, trying to make a place in this world. And he comes to the end saying, fear God and keep his commandments. Enjoy the life God's given you. Enjoy it. I told you this, Solomon spent his life and he built this great wealth and he passed it down to a generation. And you know who they passed it down to? Well, it lasted one generation. Like, let, let that sink in. Like the house that we own right now, somebody else will borrow to buy. You said, no, it's going to be passed down to my family. How long? How long before somebody sells it or has to and then somebody else? has to borrow to buy it. And we continue in this same cycle. And we worry about it. And we're anxious about it. And we're distracted. And he tells us, Scripture tells us right here, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, 
And all these things will be added to you. Not saying we shouldn't work hard. Not saying we shouldn't give ourselves to things in this world. God has given us things to keep busy with. But what we prioritize and what we seek and what we devote our lives to is seeking God, laying up treasures in heaven, and enjoying this life for God's glory. We should be the people as Christians who are at peace because guess what? We have the right perspective of this world. We know that there's a better place awaiting. We know that there is a place full of peace and love and joy with Jesus. And so we're just here for a short time doing the most that we can to bring glory to God. Knowing that our life is short. Knowing that it only will appear for a short time. So that's how we should live, church. We should live that way. Enjoying this life. Telling others about Jesus, loving God, and loving others. Now, sadly, I know anxious moments are going to arise. And the beauty of being a Christian is this. When we have those anxious moments, we can run to Jesus. Let me pause this whole sermon and say this. I preach this, and it's really hard to hear because we are all sinful. Myself included. We all need the gospel. We all need reminding. We as sinful people always gravitate to sinful things, anxiety, and, and, and the distractions of this world. We all gravitate to these things because we are sinful, depraved people, and it's why we need Jesus. And so I want you to get from this series that you need Jesus. You need him. In your worst of days, you need Him. Every day when you wake up and you pray, you need to be reminded of what you're giving your life to. We need that. We need the Holy Spirit producing that in our life. The beauty of the gospel is we, could do, do, we couldn't do anything to magnify the name of Christ. We were hopeless and we were sinful. And so in bringing glory to God, Jesus came to redeem us. And now we are reconciled back to God and we have this opportunity to tell others how to be reconciled to. We get to understand the beauty that this world is what it is. But that we have a home prepared for us. And that's what we look forward to. We get to understand that because of the gospel and because of Jesus. If this world is all there is, then that is sad. Because that means that your great-great-grandparents worked hard and you probably don't even know their name. And if you do, that may be the only thing you really know about. And that one day, you will be a grandparent and maybe your great-grandparents, your great-grandkids know you. Maybe. Maybe. Maybe, but the ones after them will never. And they won't know your personality or what you were about or what you bought or what you worked for. They will not know. And if your great-great-grandkids won't know, then absolutely nobody else in this world will. So if this world is all there is, we will spend our life working for nothing. Nothing. Because it'll all go away. And we'll all be forgotten. Just like the generations before us. Just like them. I know my great-grandfather's name. And I've heard two stories. And I pass that. I only know names from Ancestry.com. I have nothing else. No stories. Nothing. And that doesn't make me sad. It puts it all in perspective. I know that I am broken and sinful just like you. And I know that I live in a broken and sinful world just like you. 
And the only chance that I have to living a life of meaning and purpose is to seek God, lay up treasures in heaven, and enjoy this short little life for God's glory. That's it. And that's the, that's the truth that Solomon is trying to teach us. Generations come and generations grow, go. So why are we here? And it is to magnify the name of Christ. That's why we're here. So work hard. Every day, work hard. Enjoy this gift of life. Don't worry, because we know God's in control. Well, pastor, I worry about dying. Well, let me take all worry away from you. You're going to die. Let's go ahead and put that behind you. It's going to happen. Just know where you're going. If you're going to worry, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Don't worry. Love God, love others, lay up treasures, tell people about Jesus. I find this whole chapter interesting because how do we get here? Like, how do you get to a place where you're reminded of this often? Right? Like, how, how do you keep this type of mindset and perspective? And, and Solomon tells us. And it's pretty, pretty fascinating what he says here because he's tried everything, right? And he actually finds something that was of value to him. <laughs> Shouldn't that like say, whoo, okay. Well, what is it, Solomon? Like wise man, right? The most wise man of the ancient world. Like what did you find that was of actual value then in this world? Look at chapter 4, verse 9. Here's what he found that was of value. And man, this was so encouraging to me here. Look at, look at chapter 4, verse 9. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toll. Two are better than one. He goes on in verse 12 to say this. And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. You know that that's quoted in a lot of marriage ceremonies, right? This it talks about prayer. You know, it's just quoted in, in doing life. And and this is point three that I, I want you to get. This is what Solomon said will remind us and be of value here in this earth. Friendship. Friends help us seek God. Friends help us lay up treasures. And friends help us enjoy life for God's glory. Are you intentional with your friends? Do you have friends? Do you pursue godly friendships? Do you invest in friendships? Do you pray for your friends? You know, one of your greatest friends should be your spouse. You know, spouses would be greater friends if they realized they were married to a sinner. Man, it would really help your friendship. Man, I love that dude. I love that, that girl. They're a sinner just like I am. No, my, my expectations are real low for them. Real love. And man, man, our relationship flourishes because I know that. Isn't that true? Friends, true godly friends help us seek God, don't they? They remind us of what's important. True godly friends help us lay up treasures in heaven. At the end of the day, at least you're telling your friends about Jesus. Jesus. Now you're laying up treasures because you're like, hey, listen, you're a sinner. You need Jesus. I'm like you are too. Amen. Treasures in heaven. Laying them up. Reminding, them, reminding each other. Right? They, they help us lay up treasures. They remind us of what we're to be about. We need these friends. And they help us enjoy life. 
When's the last time you just laughed with some friends? It's good for your soul. Like, it is good for your heart to just laugh. You know, we live in such a sensitive culture that you can't laugh at each other. It's one of the worst things that's happened. Right? Like, some of, some of our greatest friends should be the people that we don't pick on, right? Not bully, I don't mean it, but we laugh together. It's okay sometimes for my friends to laugh at my expense because I'm sometimes um, not a funny person, but I do things that people should laugh at because they're ridiculous. And that's okay for me to admit that. Laugh. Breathe. This world is not the end-all, be-all. Heaven is with Jesus. So, so God has allowed us to have friends. He has allowed us to laugh. He has allowed us to unite together with friends to glorify God and to tell others about God. We have a church here to, to grow in and to laugh together and to serve the Lord. We should do it. We should breathe. We should hug each other. We should laugh. We should enjoy I think I would end with, with this. Do you have the right perspective of this world? What will it take for you to prioritize Jesus and to enjoy life? What will it take? I hope you knowing that Jesus has redeemed you knowing that the Holy Spirit lives inside of you and seeing the wisdom from Solomon through the inspired word of God. I hope that would be what you need. And I hope this 4th of July, and not because it's my birthday, but it is. So celebrate Independence Day, absolutely, but just kidding. Um, but I hope that this 4th, that you will laugh, that you will breathe, that you enjoy the freedoms, and that you will tell somebody about a wonderful place called heaven where Jesus is. Let's pray. God, thank you uh, for who you are. That despite our sinfulness, you offer grace. Despite our anxiety, you offer peace. This world beats us up, chews us up, and spits us out, God. And this world is often hard to live in. But may we constantly be reminded that there's a better place. And may we long for that place. And in longing for the place called heaven with you, may we long for others to come with us through Jesus. So God, as we work hard every day, help us to work hard knowing that this is what we do because this is the work you've left us to do here on earth. But even in working hard, help us to prioritize working for you and telling others about you. God, thank you for a free country, a place to worship you freely, a place to smile and to laugh and to Shoot off fireworks. But Father, what I really thank you for is the place you've prepared for us. And I long for everybody in this world to be there. So I pray this morning that lost will be saved. And those that don't know if they're saved, that they will work out their salvation today. It's in Jesus' name we pray.